Coming up, deal done in Missouri. A sexting scandal topples one of the state's most powerful politicians. Saying goodbye to another Kansas City, Missouri school superintendent. Meanwhile, another superintendent calling it quits. Why the head of North Kansas City schools taking a number two slot in Blue Valley. And from dream to reality, a convention hotel announced for downtown Kansas City. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes, good to have you with us again. What an amazingly newsy week it has been. We're going to pour through those stories with no delay, helping us connect the dots. Kansas City Star political columnist and the host of Up to Date on KCUR-FM, Steve Kraske, covering the Missouri Legislature and City Hall for KCUR News, Ellie Moxley. From the call, senior writer Eric Wesson and star reporter, columnist and blogger Dave Helling. A help wanted sign is going out again for someone to lead the Kansas City, Missouri School District. Superintendent Steve Green announcing he is departing for Atlanta. Unique set of circumstances that would cause us to leave Kansas City have to do with our children and our grandchildren. I hope that if in, in my departure, um, and I know that the Kansas City Public Schools is in good shape. Now, Green was recently named Missouri Superintendent of the Year. In fact, at a ceremony honoring him, he received a white physician's coat and a stethoscope for resuscitating what they described as a critically ill patient, the Kansas City, Missouri School District. So with so much momentum, why now, Ellie? You know, I think this really is something. I don't think this job was on Green's radar. He said he was contacted by a search firm last month, mid-month, mid-April, and then, you know, interviews progressed very quickly. He interviewed in Atlanta the first week of May, and I really think this is a family decision. I don't think there had been any real indicators that he was exiting the school district or even thinking of leaving before his contract with options that was supposed to go through 2018. Is this a done deal? Because it was always said, oh, he's a finalist for this job in this Atlanta area school district. He's the only finalist, okay. and the way it works is in this particular school district, they have to, they announce their final candidate, then there's 14 days that have to pass before they can offer them a job. So yes, it is a done deal. That's why they scheduled, you know, kind of press, a press conference in Kansas City to announce he was out, and a, a press conference in Georgia to announce he was in. Just last month, Eric West, and even his wife, the superintendent's wife, was saying at a ceremony, oh, we're here, we have our heart in this district, we are staying. It seems like such an abrupt change in such a short period of time if it's about family. Money makes you do strange things, and I'm sure that that will be a very lucrative contract there. But let me say this. I, I think that in the end, we, you know, they say he turned the district around, and maybe he did, maybe he didn't. We won't know for three years because the test scores run three years behind. The interesting thing about it is that the board allowed him to fly around the country and market himself under the Great City Schools plan. Uh, they turned the district around. Him and Eric West were all over the country talking about what a fabulous job. But at a $400,000 a year, if I wanted to see my grandkids, you know, uh, Southwest Airlines has great sales. I could fly down there every weekend. They could come up to see me. I, I think it's money is, is at the Steve, bottom of it. you know, I think two things, Nick. We all owe Dr. Green a debt of gratitude. Uh, he pushed uh, this district in the right direction, and it's about time, a long time in coming. Having said that, what a terrific loss for Kansas City, what a terrific, terrific loss for this district. I mean, this guy did bring this district into provisional status. There was hope to take it on down the road to full accreditation here. The problem here is that with a new superintendent, you don't know what you're going to wind up with. There are so many wild cards in terms of changes in curriculum and, and administration the new super will want to bring to the district. Then you throw in the politics of this, and will the business community sign off on the new superintendent? Will the new super get along with the parents and with the uh, the school community? You know, we've had so many issues with so well, many other But we never hear about as much about the board anymore as we used to, uh, Dave Helling. And, and the superintendent has been here four years. Doesn't it make it a much easier deal to bring in a much higher quality candidate as a superintendent than it has been in the past? Not necessarily, Nick, because the universe of school superintendents who have shown some ability 
to do school reform in urban districts is very, very small. That's yeah. one of the reasons Stephen Green was so attractive in Atlanta, because there just aren't a lot of superintendents out there in urban settings who have not been, in essence, chased off at some point because he or she have been unable to bring success to those districts. So it's going to take some effort for Kansas City, if it wants to, to find some figure from another district to bring in. My guess is they may do it internally. Stephen Green was an internal candidate, uh, and they may turn to that route again. Eric. And I, I want to say another thing, in addition to everything that's been said, he got a unique situation because when he came on, there was a new board. So there was no real ill feelings about uh, people coming in, working in a hostile environment. And another thing that we have to take into consideration as well is Senate Bill, House Bill 42 is still on the table. And that's a bill that's going to deal with whether or not kids have to stay in an unaccredited school district. So the transfer rule is still in effect. I know he's been down there lobbying for them to do away with it, and that could still be a factor in why he left. And the other thing to keep in mind is the Kansas City School District is drastically smaller than it used to be. Uh, so it is easier in some ways to administer than it might have been, say, 20 or 30 years Which is ago why in the it's striking to me of all the problems. It's striking today. to me, Ellie, why the superintendent is interested in going to the specific school district in the Atlanta area. The school district here is about 15,000. This is 100,000 students. This is not an easy job he's dealing with there. No, I think that it's one of those things, though. They've been, DeKalb County Schools, they've been sitting in the middle of kind of an instability fight over their school board. It's only been a couple of years since the Georgia government actually had to go in and replace two-thirds of that school board because they just couldn't get along, couldn't make it work. Now, this is not the school district that was involved in the cheating scandal that so many people heard about, no, is it? No, this is another Atlanta area school district. They've had their own problems, and they've been, you know, in Georgia, it's not the state that accredited accredit schools. It's a different agency, but they almost had their accreditation yanked. So that's why Green is a very attractive candidate yes. for them. You know, Ellie just mentioned a very important word, and that's stability, Nick. It's, Dr. Green's been around for four or five years now. That's long enough for us to forget how instable uh, this unstable this district has been for so many years and he brought a sense of that for the first time in decades Nick that's why it's such a big loss three weeks ago on this program we pushed aside our regular reporter roundtable to bring you four school superintendents Steve Green was here so was the superintendent of the North Kansas City School District but not any longer he resigns this week too what is going on with our area school superintendents and is appearing on Kansas City Week in Review a kiss of death <laughs> Tom White announces he is taking a job as an assistant superintendent in the Blue Valley School District he makes $256,000 a year as the head of the largest school district on the Missouri side of state line why would he resign as the top dog to become number two in Blue Valley. Uh, well, first of all, let's just be clear, being on this program is the kiss of okay. death. I've been on this <laughs> thing for so long and my career is just going right in the uh, dumper. Um, uh, again, it gets back to what I think, Nick, I said earlier, the demand for high quality school superintendents or school officials is pretty strong because it's a tough job. It requires a lot of commitment of time, particularly at the higher levels. There just aren't that many people uh, uh, out there that have exhibited uh, high quality performance and so they get paid well and the demand for them is high a and there may be some more stability in the Blue Valley District than maybe north of the Yeah, river. he can go to work for Tom Trigg, a highly respected superintendent right. in Blue Valley. He's been heading a district, the largest uh, district in the Kansas City area, almost 20,000 kids. As Dave just points out, Nick, that's a lot of responsibility. He can shed some of that by going out to Blue Valley. A sexting scandal has toppled arguably one of the most powerful politicians in the Missouri State Capitol. Speaker of the House John Deal resigns his leadership post and his legislative seat after the Kansas City Star publishes sexually suggestive texts between the top-ranking Republican and a 19-year-old freshman college student who had been working as an intern at the Capitol. Look, I made a statement today um, about a couple of poor decisions I made. Um, I apologize. Um, I've apologized to my caucus um, and to people in my life that are important to me. It was, uh, it was very regrettable. It was a stupid thing to do, and, and I'm sorry.
You know, first of all, how could the star be so sure, though, at the beginning of the story that these were texts actually coming from John Deal himself and that it wasn't an imposter, somebody posing as him, Steve? Well, the star spent a lot of time on this story making sure those texts were what they were. Uh, they were from John Deal. And at the end of the day, Nick, uh, John Deal admitted they were his texts. So the issue here is also why, why did he have to resign? Some people are saying, well, why did he have to resign? They look at Bill Clinton as the president of the United States who survived four years after uh, having a relationship with an intern and, and he stays in the White House and that occurred at the White House, Ellie? I mean, I think this comes down to, you see this a lot when you have, especially Republicans involved in these types of scandals. You know, when you run on family values, when you make morality a part of your campaign, it's a lot harder to hold up to this kind of incident. You have a lot more scrutiny when you do make a mistake. There was no chance for him to survive this day? No, not in the long term. Um, uh, you know, I think we were a little surprised that it came so quickly. Uh, I think there was some thought that he might survive until today, the end of the session, and then maybe quit in a month or so. But he couldn't survive at largely because, or at least in part because, Nick, the Republican Party, of which he is an important, powerful member, has been through an enormous uh, uh, series of problems over the past six months. Tom Schweik, uh, Spence Jackson, and now this. I mean, it was such a distraction. I'm sure he was told Thursday by many Republicans that your tenure would simply not be, you, you, you can't go on. People would be talking about this. And frankly, people would be asking him about it for months. You know, the speaker always has a news conference at the end of the session. He would have been standing there today. None of the questions would have been about the legislature, but instead about this scandal. So he, that, let me just say, can I just, yeah. but just take a little privilege, because Steve talked about this. We must give enormous credit to Jason Hancock, the reporter for this story, Murray Williams helped, uh, Scott Cannon, his editor, and Greg Farmer, his supervisor. This is what quality reporting is like. And for those who think we can live in a blog world where you just get a rumor, throw it yeah. up, Amen. the reality yeah. is good, solid reporting still matters in this state and in this country, and we saw it this week. Where did the story come from? Uh, you know, I saw it from afar. I, it, we got a tip. And they worked for a month to verify the tip. And Nick, as late as Wednesday, Speaker Deal and the uh, young woman involved were still denying the authenticity of the text messages. They worked hard to prove it by other means, did so, we published, and you saw what happened. Eric. There's a very dangerous item on all of our cell phones, and it's called SEND. And what we've got going on with people is they're using government phones to do these type of things. I think, one, the credibility and integrity would have been in question, and he would have been walking around with a bullseye on his back the entire time he was in the house. So it's that kind of thing. And then you go back to even the situation we had with the city council person. What goes through people's minds when they push that send button on these phones? Yeah. It is retrievable. People can get that information. That's back. what surprised you, Ellie. <laughs> it was on his work phone. It wasn't even on a personal cell phone. And it just seems like the kind of thing that if you're going to do it, you'd want to keep it separate. Yeah, and, the, and, and frankly, anything. the fact that it was on the phone suggests that what, some of the things we were told this week, Nick, that this is part of a broader cultural problem in Jeff City are probably fairly accurate. It, it, it seems as if the speaker believed that this is such normal behavior that he would get away with it. You know, and it, if that's true, that the, the scandal has broader implications than just what happens. It to is John part Hill. of a broader cultural problem in Jeff City. I've noticed it from the first day I stepped in that building back in 1988. How wide open the atmosphere is there. People feel they can get away with things there because they're so far away from the rest of civilization in Kansas City and mm -hmm. in St. Louis. It's so interesting to me, Nick. Look at the history of Missouri speakers going back a few decades. Yeah. Richard Rabbit. Bob Griffin, you know, Rod Jetton, the Steve grand jury hearing, Steve Tilley had huge ethical issues, and now John Deal. The House Speaker is, is seen as the single most powerful person in the legislature. That much power clearly is, is, is too much for too many people to handle down but there. But the Republican chamber has now picked Todd Richardson to yes. replace John Deal. I mean, he's, he's su suggesting changes that are going to take place right now. Do you see that happening? I think they'll have to happen, and, and Todd Richardson can bring them 
them along. Keep in mind, Nick, his father was a former Republican leader in the Missouri House of Representatives, got in trouble over a DUI incident back a number of years ago. Okay, the sexting scandal is attracting all the attention, of course, but diverting focus from some major issues being decided this very week. One, whether to make Missouri a right-to-work state. Proponents frame this as nothing more than giving workers the freedom of choice to join a union. Currently, they argue, Missouri is a closed shop state, which means if it's a union business, workers are forced to join a union and pay dues as a condition of employment. A bill changing that rule has just been approved by the legislature and sent to the governor's desk. What do opponents think will happen if this becomes law? Well, labor unions have resisted right-to-work legislation in Missouri for decades because they fear it will further cost them membership. People will not want to pay dues to the union and still be able to be employed. This has been put on the ballot a couple times, and the labor movement has fought vigorously to keep a right-to-work out of the state of Missouri. Uh, you know, the Republicans may have been too clever by half. They, they got it through the Senate in a rarely used parliamentary move that has really infuriated the Democrats in the last hours. The governor says he'll veto it. It does not appear as if there is a margin to override that veto, so right to work may still not come to Missouri, and yet other things may fall by the wayside as a result. You know, I got a it press really was a problem in the final uh, There was a press release this week from Catherine Hannaway, who was running for governor, saying, you know, if we pass this, there will be more jobs in the state of Missouri, there will be more investment in the state of Missouri. What is the evidence for that, Steve? Well, that's the argument. They point to uh, what's happened in, in states that uh, adopted right to work, and they also point to a survey, Nick, of CEOs and corporate recruiters that over overwhelmingly showed uh, that people feel strongly that you bring right to work here, employers will hire more people. That's simple. But just because the legislature has now brought this to the governor's desk, it does not mean that the governor has to sign this measure, and he could veto this, and that's the likely outcome. Right. He said so as much this week, and again, there does not appear to be in the House anyway sufficient votes to override that veto unless you get a, a, a vote, uh, you know, by party. They, there are override, firm override majorities in both houses in the General Assembly. That may be not uh, the case here. Nick, just quickly, there's a political play going on here. If Republicans can get right to work there, that deep decreases the amount of money that unions can raise in Missouri, that decreases the amount of money they can donate to Democratic candidates around the state. That's one more reason why Republicans As we were putting this, this program today, one of our producers says, what does it mean really, though, to do union dues? What, what, how much are we talking about here? Is this like, is like $10 a month? I mean, what is a union dues? No, it's, uh, it's it can varied. be more substantial, but it is not overwhelming. I okay. mean, it might be a couple of hundred dollars 1%. a year. Okay. Typically. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But the problem that African American workers have in the construction industry is they pay the union dues and they still sit on the bench. And and that's been an ongoing problem as well. And a lot of these projects are, are union job only projects and it's been creating a problem. For right, and that was brought up, by the way, on the Senate floor by Democrats who, who were hypercritical of union histories on discriminatory practices. As a Kansas City bridge over the Missouri River was forced to shut down last week due to unexpected structural issues, the alarm bells are ringing again over the state of Missouri's crumbling roads and bridges. Governor Nixon held a press conference at the northbound 291 bridge over the Missouri River where he pushed lawmakers to pass a hike in the gas tax before they headed out of town. But has it encouraged lawmakers finishing up their session in Jefferson City to support such an increase? Or is this sexting scandal diverted attention from all of that? I mean, is that sort of basically put a stop to all these issues? Well, uh, I'm not sure in the absence of the sexting scandal we would have had a, a gas tax increase okay. anyway because the legislature doesn't seem very right. enthusiastic about tax increases of any kind. Regardless of the motive or the reason, it doesn't look like that's coming to Missouri. Okay, but and Kansas is also looking at a gas tax increase too, Steve. Absolutely. You know, uh, five cents a gallon, uh, you know, they're, they're looking at it very hard as a way to deal with money that the Brownback administration has siphoned away from transportation to pay for other issues and the that, state that, budget. That, that's absolutely a key. The, the nickel a gallon in Kansas is not about fixing the roads. Uh, it's about providing money to cover the budget deficit in Kansas. In Missouri, the two cent increase would have gone for some transportation projects. And yet even that was a bridge too far to coin a phrase for the Republicans. But the problem in Missouri lingers, Nick. No Two question. cents a gallon would not have solved the issue. This, this problem is going to be around for years to come. We'll talk more about the Kansas legislature next week as they continue to wrap up their session there in Topeka. It's been a dream of city and convention leaders for years. Now it looks like it's finally becoming a reality.
Game on. Kansas City has really pulled its chair up to the table of great cities. Plans for a new $300 million, 800-room convention hotel downtown are formally unveiled this week. The proposed new Hyatt Convention Hotel would sit right between Bartle Hall and the Kaufman Center for the Performing Arts. A block from the new streetcar line, the city would kick in $2.3 million for 25 years to help pay for the project. The development team, led by former mayoral candidate Mike Burke, would not pay taxes on the project for 30 years. And the Hyatt would get an exclusive deal to cater all events in the convention center ballroom for 15 years. The mayor has long said he will only support a convention hotel if the city can find a way to do it. That's not overly burdensome, he says, to the city. Is this deal being viewed as overly burdensome to the city or just about right, Dave? Well, I think there is general support for the idea that we can do this without bonding, without having the city guarantee the borrowing, in essence, which brings down the interest rate and brings down the costs, but puts the city on the hook if there's a shortfall in revenue, just as the city is now on the hook for the power and light district. Mm -hmm. But you'll still hear rumbles from people who are not completely happy with the idea of a what they call a super tiff for this project which in essence means all of the taxes generated by this hotel will go back into the hotel that that causes some discomfort for people and then the outright subsidy is a bit of a problem but you don't I, I think we've been working on this for a quarter century the momentum is pretty strong behind this but is the city mechanism. really losing all of these conventions because it simply doesn't have enough hotel rooms so the, the logic basically works like this because Kansas City doesn't have you know this big hotel they can't even attract some of these large conventions that cities like Denver and Indianapolis that are kind of peer cities to Kansas City that have, they've been able to court having built convention hotels so they're saying this would be good for everyone not just the Hyatt but the other hotels that are already downtown because we could get these bigger hotels Eric or is it that many conventions to warrant having an 800, an additional 800 room hotel. One of the things that people talked about uh, that called the newspaper was that we didn't get the Republican convention. Well, the Republican convention happens once every four years, and it usually goes to cities that are in play during an election city. It's a uh, cycle. So we're not really in play since this is really have turned into a Republican state. So Ohio, those places, they're always that swing state. That's where the conventions are. But are there enough conventions year round to warrant the revenue that they believe that this is going to The make? mayor saying there's, there's no risk to the city in this. It's not like the power and light district. We're not going to be on the hook for cost overruns and so on. So we shouldn't be too bent out of shape about this. Steve. Right. And I think we're underselling this a little bit, Nick. I think by and large, most city leaders view this as a huge win for the city. This has, again, been on the drawing boards for a quarter century here. Here we are on the brink of a very um, a big development, a step forward for the city. Uh, one question that lingers is the impact on other hotels downtown, what, what it's going to mean for some of these smaller boutique hotels. One other final point here, the guy who negotiated this deal behind the scenes was Mike Burke. Mike Burke's going to make some money off of this deal for sure. Having said that, he ran for mayor against Sly James a few years ago and lost. But the two of them ran a cordial campaign. They continue to be cooperative. And look what that kind of approach to politics and governing, how it pays off in the long run. But some people say, oh, he's making a mint out of well, this. Well, he is making a mint off yes. of this. Well, uh, I don't think he's, he's worked very hard on it. And I don't think he, and, and you know, we, I think we have to take people in good faith. And I think he, he wants this as the city has sought this for many years. He'll make money on it, of course, but others will too. Two, construction workers. The, the question is, uh, uh, the broader question is whether, and, and I think Eric hinted at this, whether there is sufficient convention business to not only justify this uh, outlay of cash and tax benefits and subsidies, but whether or not other cities seeing this will respond in kind and mm -hmm. it becomes sort of mutually thing. assured destruction and you look up five years from now and the city says, gosh, this hotel didn't work the way we thought. <laughs> We're really going to need some extra money or we need a new Ferris wheel or we need a merry-go-round or something downtown. That story has been told in Kansas City for a quarter century as well. You know, it may be time for those who boost downtown to put up or shut up, and we'll see if they well, do. It has better work because yeah. the convention yeah. people have been saying for a long time.
time, it will work if we get the hotel. Okay, well, building a downtown convention hotel has been the dream for decades. Now that it looks like city leaders can take off that box, what's the next big splashy project on the horizon? We already have a new arena, performing arts center, and now streetcars. A multiple choice question for our panelists this week. Is it a downtown ballpark next? A bi-state tax for the arts? Finally, fulfilling a dream for a state-of-the-art children's museum. Making a bid for the Olympics. After all, we now have the hotel rooms. And what a great reuse for Kemper Arena. Olympic Stadium Day, come on. Yeah. Oh, E, something completely different, Steve. Well, it should have been a downtown ballpark, Nick. I've talked about that here okay. before. It's going to be a streetcar expansion, Nick. That's the next big that, thing. That's the next big project. Eric. Streetcar expansion and the Prospect Corridor expansion. Uh, Morningstar is going to be building some senior housing. Uh, Palestine's possibly going to be doing the same. They Churches. try to connect everything to the police station as the anchor and then build around it. What, what did you think of the timing, um, Eric? Because uh -huh. we had the grocery store timing, didn't we? The week before the convention hotel timing. Well, John, do you think that was uh, that was that done was on purpose? Accident. That was not <laughs> a, just happened to be a oh, coincidence. Just, okay, I think right. it was designed to okay, do that. A next big project, Ellie? <laughs> I think I think Steve's right on this one. It's going to have to be a streetcar expansion because otherwise you're not going to be able to go that far from that new downtown hotel. Yes, the, the correct correct answer is E, none of the above. The next big project is the airport, and they're going to have to figure out what to do with the airport, and it'll probably be on the ballot next year, one way or another. Uh, even the people at the hotel announcement were saying, yeah, the next big thing is to look at is KCI. Now, as we were devising this, uh, one of our producers said, um, oh, wh why we, you need to put the word sewers in there? We have this multi-billion <laughs> yes, dollar problem. Yes. Whatever happened to that? We're supposed to have had this huge problem. Has it been working? Are we oh, doing it, something on it? They're still working right. on it. It's been, the EPA gave the city a little bit more time, okay. Nick. It's, it's coming. Okay, so we still have that working, and we are doing things on that. All right, right, right. That, that's good to know. And that is <laughs> it's a relief. very good to know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Well, we, we forget about some of these things that are actually no going question. on. All righty. No that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers from KCUR Radio, Ellie Moxley, and from the Kansas City Star, Dave Helling. He keeps you up to date weekday mornings at 11 on KCUR FM, Steve Kraske. And from the pages of the Kansas City Coal newspaper, Eric Wesson, for another perspective on the Metro's news, join Mike Shannon for Ruckus Sunday morning at 11.30, right after the rebroadcast of this program, Sunday morning morning at 11. I'm Nick Haynes from all of us here at KCPT. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.